this presentation is very much an extension of the one I gave last year, I don't know if you remember it, on the resolution, which was the third rate of 1670. The Charles Galley frigate is of the same era as resolution and designed by the same shipwright family. My model was built in the 1980s to the same scale and in the Navy board style as resolution. So I won't repeat information that was part of my previous presentation. Charles is, however, a very different type of warship to resolution. During the 17th century, the Admiralty and the Navy Board had used oars and sweeps as an auxiliary form of propulsion for some smaller sailing warships. But around 1670, it became clear that frigate-sized, lightly built, fast oared warships were needed to combat the Barbary Corsairs in the Mediterranean. Charles II heard about a new type of French sail and oared vessel, one of which may have been a ship named La Bien Emi, which was launched at Toulon in 1672. It seemed to be the type of ship that was needed, so he asked the son of the shipwright, Sir Anthony Dean, to go to Toulon to view the ship and get its dimensions. The result was that the Navy ordered two galley frigates designed by the Anthony Dean's father and son based on the French pattern. The ship named Charles, this one, this ship um, named Charles, was built at Woolwich by the young Phineas Pett III to the Dean's design. And a sister ship named James was built at Blackwall by Anthony Dean Jr. He surprisingly sublet his contract to another shipwright, Henry Johnson. Don't know why. At their launch in 1676, both ships were rated as fourth rates. I decided to bottle the Charles because there was more information available about, available about her than about the James. First of all, there is this oil painting of her in the National Maritime Museum by Willem van der Velde, the Elder, which gives good details of her appearance in 1676. Note the pinnace being towed behind the ship with some crew aboard. I believe that this was normal practice that stopped the boat drying out and also it, it was able to rescue any crew members that fell in. There's also a detailed ship portrait in the National Maritime Museum, which includes the stern decoration. And the other thing to look at here is the quarter gallery. I'll talk about that in a minute. It was by the same artist, by Villa van der Velde again. And the cook here seems to be working in the galley, which is another interesting element you'll find later on. This is a draft of a ship in the Maritime Museum, and you can just see the title up at the top here. And it says, His Majesty's Ship, the Charles Galley, built at Woolwich in 1626 by Mr. Phineas Pett, said to be projected by His Majesty Charles II. But the interesting thing is that the date of this draft shows it was prepared many years after the Charles was launched. And there are several conflicts between it and the paintings of the ship that I've just showed you, especially at the stern. The open gallery, which is here on the painting, is missing on the draft. And the gunnery on the quarter deck on the draft are missing on the painting. So there is conflict. The thing is that the Charles was rebuilt three times during its long life. So the possibility is that this draft 
may well have been one of the rebuilds. There are also some early sketches and a contemporary model, which may be of the Charles, in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, and I had a good look at that. Again, there are differences in some of the details. So this is the difficulty of trying to model a ship in the 17th of the 17th century. However, putting all the information together, it enabled me to draw up plans of the Charles with what I hope is reasonable accuracy. The model is to the classic scale of 1 to 48, and it's built in the Navy Board style, which, as I said, um, was in my presentation on uh, resolution. She was designed for maximum speed and maneuverability. She was long and narrow. Her keel length was 114 feet, and her width was 28 foot 8 inches, a width to length ratio of about 4 to 1. She had an armament of 32 guns, which were 26 six pounder sakers and six three pounders. 22 of the guns were sighted on the upper deck, which you can see all the way down here, with only three guns aside on the lower deck, two there and one up here. This left a large space on the lower deck for 20 sweeps aside, each sweep manned by three or four seamen. This draft of an unknown ship of 1625 in the National Maritime Museum again shows that unlike Mediterranean galleys, the oarsmen in galley frigates stood at the sweeps rather than being seated on benches. I have assumed that this would apply to the Charles. The draft also shows the length of the sweeps. Those for the Charles were 29 feet. This is longer than the inside width of the ship. So the oars had to be stored fore and aft somewhere in the middle here. Getting 40 of these sweeps out through the small ports at the same time must have been quite a problem. Each sweep was retained in position when rigged for rowing by a strap secured to an iron post built into each port. You see the posts there. You can just make out the straps. The ship was also very unpopular on the Thames, as over a hundred members of the Thames Waterman's Company were impressed or, or recruited to work the sweeps. The model was constructed in basswood with tunnels, rails, and sweeps in Warner. The finish was natural unpainted, except for the whales and top timbers, which were painted matte black, and the decorations were gilded. This galley frigate was highly decorated, rather more so than usual on a fourth-rate ship. This is probably the result of Charles II's interest in her. The figurehead of a rampant lion supported by figures on rails of the head, on the rails of the head, is, however, a normal figurehead for a fourth rate of the period. The model is shown resting on four sea monsters, one there, another two at the other end. All the decorative figures on the model were roughly moulded in a epoxy putty and then carved and gilded. Where a figure was repeated several times, like these figures here, a master carving was made, and from that, a silicon mold, rubber, a silicon rubber mold was made, and the final figures were cast in resin. The stern and quarter galleries are also highly decorated. The windows were made of clear acetate sheet, and the leaded lights were drawn on in black ink. The quarter galleries here are unusual with this short open gallery at the forehead's end. Do you remember I was pointing that out as showing some of the differences that I found on information? The stern lanterns are made from marbles, clear glass marbles, and the brass framing is glued on. The pinnace is shown moored alongside. It was constructed on a mould 
The ribs were bent over the mould, each one glued to the keelson and to the mould above the line of the gunner. The boat was then carval planked. The shell of the boat up to the gunwale was removed and the mould and uh, from the mould and internal fittings added. The ship was steered from the upper deck using a whipstaff connected directly to the tiller, which was at high level on the lower deck. If you look closely, you can see the whipstaff there behind the mizzen. The helmsman must have been directed from the quarter deck through a, a hatch. Yeah. He didn't see much of the sails himself being so low down in the ship. The capstan is one of the last of the old barrel type. Four holes were drilled right through the barrel and the bars were pushed through each hole. You probably know all this. One of the problems was that few, only a few of the bars were at optimum height for the pushing. You see, this one's down here and this one is right up at the top. So it wasn't very efficient. Within a few years, the drumhead type of capstan was introduced with more bars all at the same height. The six pounder SATA guns on the Charles were a lower caliber of weapon than usual for a frigate, probably intended to reduce weight and therefore increase the speed of the ship. The folks bulkhead, as you can see, is a complicated structure with the Highly decorated belfry with ship's bell in the centre here. And there are two fixed cabins, small cabins, one on each side, and one was for the cook and the other for the boatswain's mate. One of the interesting things about this ship is that there were two boatswains. One looked after the 160 oarsmen, and the other looked after the rest of the crew. Right at, just ahead of the Bulkhead is the galley, and you will see that it's an iron hearth. This isn't a very, this isn't a very good photograph, I'm afraid, but you, you might be able to make it out. This is the, the, the chimney, and there is an iron hearth down there. The interesting thing about this is that iron hearths were first used to any great extent in the middle of the 18th century, that's in about about 60 or 70 years on, although obviously their design must have existed for some time before that, because the Charles was fitted with an iron hearth rather than having copper kettles embedded in brickwork, probably to reduce weight. It must have been one of the first ships to have one. Here we're looking down from above through to the great cabin and showing up the panelling of the walls. Now this is showing one of the officers' cabins, very small cabins they had, and they are put between the guns, and they had to be demountable structures, and they were collapsed and taken away before the ship could go into action, and all the officers' gear finished up in the hold. The rigging is standard frigate pattern. All the larger ropes were made on my homemade rope walk with smaller running ropes obtained commercially. I thought you might like to see my rope walk. It's 2.3 meters long and the traveler here is sitting on a model railway truck which runs on the track. And it starts from down here and as you rotate all the gear wheels, they turn the individual strands which pass over the traveller and end up as a piece of rope. So you can do left hand laid rope or right hand laid rope, whichever way you rotate the handle. That's just another shot of it showing me that this rope I've got here is three strands, you see, but there are the ability to have another strand in here, which is four strand ropes. Charles had a long life. In 1691, she was downgraded to a fifth rate, probably because the caliber of her armament was more appropriate to that rate. She was rebuilt in 1693 and again in 1710. 
this time to match fifth rates of the period. In 1729, she was again rebuilt and her name was changed to HMS Torrington and her armament changed to 28 nine-pounders and four three-pounders. Finally, in 1740, 64 years after her launch, she became a hulk and was sold four years later. So, was the galley frigate a successful class of ship? It first appeared that it was very successful. It had the speed under sail needed for a cruiser, and with 40 sweeps, its speed under oars alone was up to three miles per hour. The king was so impressed with one action in which both galleys were involved that together with the Admiralty, it was decided to construct two more galley frigates to the same specification. However, before work had started, Samuel Pepys was told that because there were so few cannon on the lower deck in close action, the galley frigates were vulnerable the number of guns on the lower deck should be increased. This, of course, would mean reducing the number of sweeps, and these vessels, therefore, would no longer be true galley frigates. So the two contracts were cancelled. In 1686, when the James was rebuilt, the ore ports were reduced from 40 to 34 to make space for 10 guns on the lower deck. And so two gun deck frigates of the Nelson era were born. All ports are still built on the lower gun deck between the guns, but they were almost useless when the guns were in action. The last true galley frigate was the American warship, Confederacy, launched in 1778. She carried 36 guns and had 26 sweeps. This last slide shows you some of the bibliography that I used in making the presentation, and quite a few of them were actually published after the date I made the model. Mm -hmm.